Hello, everyone. <coughs> Thanks a lot for joining my presentation about From Hardware to Linux. My name is Stefan, and I work as freelancer for different companies, um, mainly in the embedded Linux field, doing PSP work or hardware bring-ups. <coughs> so what is a hardware bring-up? That's maybe one question I should answer first. So think about a company who wants to create a new product. At one point, the hardware team starts to design a hardware, and then someone has to bring that hardware alive. And this bringing the hardware alive is basically the bring up where you put the software onto the hardware. So this brings me to a question to you as a, as a warm up. <clears throat> When do you think does a bring up start? Is that one when the hardware arrives, two during the component evaluation, or three after the schematic is done? So who thinks when the hardware arrives, one? Who thinks two? Okay, and who thinks three? So most people said two, which is also what I think um, is, is true. So the earlier you can get involved in selecting the right components, the, the right CPU, the right um, main components like files and so on, the better normally the bring up works because you, you already know what you're dealing with and maybe you have good driver support, you have well enough upstream supports for the components. This is something the hardware team normally cannot decide on their own. <clears throat> So when we selected the components, the main components like CPU, um, files, whatever is important for your device, um, then you have to think about the initial software load. So how do you bring the software that you want to install to the board during the bring up? Because normally the hardware arrives just plain, so it, there is nothing on it besides the boot ROM of the system on chip. However, um, you need to put it on. So there are different options like sometimes USB, serial port, even JTAG, some, some SOCs even support Ethernet, but that's something you have to, to really decide up, about in, in advance and to make sure that you select the right uh, the mechanism. Then after that, do a schematic review together with the hardware team as soon as they are ready. That helps to decide are they doing everything right? No, you just have to focus on the key components like files or um, sensors which need Linux driver support. Then you can check, is there a driver for that component? If not, you already know, okay, there is maybe a problem. If there is support, then um, that's good. And if there is maybe another device, they can still switch that. After that, you can write the device tree the earlier you start with that, the, the better normally it goes because it, maybe you still see some issues with the, <clears throat> with the hardware when you write the device tree. Um, if you do that early enough, you can still uh, tell the hardware team, hey, please change that and that so that, that you are sure you are uh, you're having a good hardware in the end. Then if the DRAM configuration is different from what the evaluation board has, so always check what is on the eval board, where are the differences. That's also something which is important. If you uh, have a DRAM configuration which is different, then check that, get used to it, learn how you can configure the, the DRAM for your hardware in the end. Then after that, create the initial root file system. You don't have to be, use a, the product root file system. It can also be something like Debian or whatever you are familiar with. It can be Yocto built, but it should help you to do some testings as soon as the hardware is ready. And this is something you can do in advance because the root FS is basically independent of the kernel, more or less, as long as you don't count the modules. <clears throat> then you can create the CI CD pipeline that is helpful just for the bootloader and the kernel. But when you are in the bring up phase and you do changes, then you can just commit them, build the latest state, and then the hardware team or the other software teams already know where they have to fetch it from. If you don't have that, you always have to build it on your own and they ask you, hey, please do it. And that's normally not going to work well. 
And for me, because I'm stupid, I have to repeat everything one week before the hardware arri arrives. So I have to check again how do I build everything, how do I boot it. Um, this is also something you can do on the evaluation board normally. Um, how does a, 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 schemat a schematic review look like? So as said, you should focus on the key components here, for example, a file, then you can just check does a driver for that file exist? If not, maybe you can choose another one or you can just add it if it's a simple uh, file. Um, then also something which is important, especially if you will have problem later on, ask them to add test points wherever possible for clock signals, for um, data signals. This is not something which is always possible, but you can talk with the hardware team and ask them, hey, please, can we not add a test point here? Maybe it works, maybe they say, no, this would act as antenna, so we cannot do that, but just ask. <clears throat> For this presentation, I was uh, choosing an AM62 from TI to do a demo bring up. So I did not do this bring up on my own um, or for this particular device. Uh, we will see later, it's a Toradex word in AM62. But I did it for a similar device, which is AM64. That's the similar architecture. That's why I'm already a bit familiar with, with the, the thing. But this hardware is not available while the working is available. And I also work for Toradex, so it's like uh, <laughs> I got it for free. <laughs> And um, yeah, we have to understand the boot flow. The boot flow is a bit special about the AM62. So you have a, a microcontroller, an R5. This is this thing here. And this R5 is booting the boot ROM. So this is something which is on the SOC. And that will then fetch the U-boot SPL, which is the first thing that runs. And it will also program an additional M4 port, which, which is just there for doing some system um, controller stuff like powering on additional CPUs, enabling clocking, and so on. Then the UBU boot SPL will wait for the next stage, so it will load the next image, and that's already the real trusted firmware and the real UBoot SPL, which runs on the application cores. So the application cores are the cores where we also want to run Linux on later on. Then the SPL will fetch again U-boot, U-boot will fit, fetch Linux, and Linux will then boot into the user space. So this is a bit, this is always different, but you have to understand that when you do the bring up. So it depends on the SOC. Um, how did the hardware setup look like? Um, so we have the initial boot mode, uh, boot, boot loading mechanism, it's this DFU USB. So this is where we load the initial SPL on through it. So it's really the initial bootloading thing we use here. And then we have a serial port. Here it's a USB serial port. It just has to be a serial port. Always convince the hardware to add a serial port if you want to do an, a bring up. You can later on not assemble it, that's fine, but you should always have a serial port available else it will be super hard to do the bring up. Um, I also use Ethernet here. Uh, that's not something which is mandatory. We could also use USB later on, but I'm so used to Ethernet, so I just thought I, I used that as well. And uh, yeah, you see here the word in, it's the, the, the eval port from Toradex. And then I also have a JTAG adapter. The JTAG adapter is not that something that you always need, but if, you, if the boot fails really early in the boot stage and you don't get any output, then JTAG might help. Um, yeah, here's just a list of some of the resources uh, I would normally recommend. I already showed a few, like the, the initial software loading mechanism that you have to, of course, also you have to, to have the material, maybe a TTL converter, um, then the power supply. Then what you should always get is the reference manual, especially if they require an NDA, because you, <laughs> they often have several days until they approve the NDAs. And then, uh, yeah, if the hardware is already here and you don't have the reference manuals, it's really hard to, to do the bring up. Then schematic and layout of the, the hardware or the, the, yeah, the product you want to have is, uh, should also be available when you do the bring up. Then maybe a JTAG probe that 
often you don't need it, but if you need it, you are uh, happy you, ha you have it. Then multimeter and oscilloscope is something which is just if you really have to debug on hardware level. If you're not familiar with that, you can also ask the hardware team to help you. Um, so then when we have that, we are uh, already trying to um, boot our device. So here is a screenshot of what I did um, for the AM62. So here what we do, we use TFU USB as told earlier. Um, we, what we can see here already, the, the loading of the um, U-boot SPL for the R5 core worked. So because we, we were able to download it, so that already means we are, we are sure that the SOC is powered, the clock is there and USB is working. So that's already something. So we would now expect on the serial port that to appear something like the SPL version, maybe some more messages, but what we can see here, nothing happens. So that's a bad sign. So what you should do now, um, you should check um, what is, with, maybe with the harder team, is the wiring correct for the serial port and so on. However, if that doesn't help, then because you cannot see anything, you need something like JTAG. So we use JTAG together with GDB to get, a, get an overview of what is going on in the, this SPL and we connect to it. The problem is the, the, the boot ROM, when it loads the SPL, it will immediately start to run the, the SPL bootloader basically. So you have no chance to attach to it. So what I normally do, I add just some debug while loop so that it waits there in the reset vector and then I can just do a jump plus one and then it will continue with the real SPL. It is also possible to add a breakpoint uh, instruction, but I'm used to the while loop somehow. <clears throat> then when we uh, let the system run, press control C and GDB, we will end up where it currently hangs and then we can print the backtrace, which we can see here. And from the backtrace, we get an understanding of what might fail. So here we can see it fails on this uh, serial find pan console or panic. That's a good site or a good name for the function because it already tells us what it does. It tries to find the serial port to have a console available there. However, it cannot find it, therefore it panics. So we know now, okay, maybe something with the, the serial port is wrong. And then we can dig into that in more detail. Through further debugging, we then figure out, okay, this OMAP serial OF to platform function fails. So we do again our jump plus one, set a breakpoint there, and then we can really step by step analyze what is failing. Here we, we can see that clock get by index is returning an error. And that of course means if it does, cannot clock the peripheral, then it cannot set the baud rate, it cannot do anything with it. So we now know, okay, we have to have a look in this direction. So it's something if the clocking is wrong. It, and for that, we check the device tree. And in the device tree, we, we will figure out, oh, we disabled the clocks accidentally. Uh, accidentally. So we have to remove that. Of course, this is not something Toradex did. It was just me <laughs> for doing, uh, to, to show this early boot failure. So if we are there, we can then load again Linux, um, or no, not Linux, we can now start the SPL, the, the SPL that will then start the trusted firmware plus the SPL on the A53, and that will then start the U-boot. So this was the sequence you saw before. Um, however, now we have another problem, U-boot crashes. So why do we know that it is U-boot? So the U-boot on the A53 says U-boot SPL, and then here, this one says U-boot, it was still able to load, it can even print something, but then we have an unhandled exception in EL3. This is not a message that is printed by U-boot. It is something sometimes a bit confusing if you search for that name. It is basically the ARM trusted firmware which prints that message. So that means U-boot did not even handle that exception. It is even worse, so it, not only the ARM trusted firmware installed uh, exception handler. 
solve because we already have JTAG. I mean, you could now use printf in theory to debug, but because we have JTAG, we use that. So um, we do the same thing as before. Again, I'm using this while loop. That's why you see the jump plus one here. Oh, I have to the plus one here. And then what is special about U-boot, U-boot does relocation. So it normally copies itself to the end of the RAM. This is, a, this is not necessary. You can also disable it, but the behavior is often that it does that. So if you want to debug U-boot, you have to understand that and you, you have to get aware of it and you, make, you have to load basically the symbols file, symbol file again to the relocated address because else you are not able to debug. So what, this is what we do here. We try to figure out where is this relocation address. Um, that's by setting a breakpoint in relocate code. And then we print the relocation address over the global data pointer. And we add the symbol file. And now we have basically twice the symbols loaded for, for both areas. And then when we set a breakpoint, we can already see we have two breakpoints set. So it's not only one, we basically set two because now we have the symbol files twice. And I set the breakpoint in port init and we can see it is really uh, executing at the relocated address 9pf before it was something with 08, 08, 08. So What I do here, I try to read from a USB controller that's also not something which is normally in there. I just added that to, to show you what can happen. Um, I try to read from that, from that address. Now, if we set a breakpoint on the next uh, line, so on 29, and then press C to continue, what will happen is we will never reach that line. Instead, we get a sick int, and uh, we can see we are crashing somewhere. So this, this here, this address, this is from the ARM Trusted Firmware. As said before, we, the message, the exception handle we saw before is not from U-boot, it is from the untrusted firmware. What does that mean? I mean, if you have something that U-boot crashes hardly or any system crashes hardly, that can mean you have either, either no power or you have no clocking. And um, this can mean you have not enabled the power domain, for example. That's a software issue, but it could also mean you have a hardware issue. If the hardware forgot to power one specific controller on your SOC, then this could also be an issue. Um, yeah, here it was the thing with the power domain, because we, are, we accessed uh, this uh, address here that early in the boot process. We didn't load the USB driver yet, and because of that, basically, the um, power domain was not enabled, which is something normally the, the USB driver does. And therefore, um, we end up with a hard crash. Um, I then enable it here as an example. It manually, you should not do that, of course. You should write the proper driver, but this is just to show you it is really the power domain. So, um, this is then how it looks like. When we did that, so now we are finally able to boot U boot, um, and we can also see we can read from that address. So this is the line we were uh, looking for. As soon as you are in the U boot console, um, don't try to use JTAG or printf or whatever if not if not necessary. I mean, there are some use cases where it is necessary, but you have so many tools available in U boot which you can use like me uh, memory dump to read from addresses. So here we read the same address as, as I was reading before. Then you have tools to debug other uh, peripherals like MDIO. As in this case, um, the first Ethernet controller would not work. So it's this one here. We can then with MDIO list see, okay, we have two Ethernet controllers. One is connected to FI address 5, one to FI address 7. Um, with MII read, we can then access the registers on the files. So we read back from uh, FI address 5 uh, an ID of FFF. <laughs> However, it should be a TI FI ID, which is 0x2. Mm. 
So it, it could mean it is easily not powered. It could also mean that it is not clocked. So the fight is time. However, uh, we just probe a bit and then we would see uh, we just took the wrong file address. So we just changed that in the device tree. It was, this would look like this. After you are able to, to use your initial software loading and you have the peripherals that are really necessary to boot your system um, working, then try to flash U-boot to the final storage as, as early as possible so you have not to do the initial software load over and over again because that is quite annoying and slow and using just the primary storage is normally much faster. They don't tell, I don't go into details what these comments do, but just be aware of that. There are some other really useful U-boot commands. Um, I cannot go into detail, unfortunately, but I just wanted to have them as reference in the slides. Um, yeah, some of them I already showed, like um, memory dump and MII. Um, some other really nice tools are port info where you can also figure out the relocation address and the device tree of U-boot. Um, and with DM3 you can analyze which drivers are probed, which, which loaded successfully and so on. So this just use help and then you will figure out what tools you have available. Some of them you can also enable through the config. So now that we are here, we want to boot Linux. That's our end goal. So um, <clears throat> Here is the boot command, I just gave it to you. You can see we boot it from TFTP. Um, we store that as, as boot command in new boot so that it does that when we just power it on, it will fetch it through TFTP. And this is now what happens. So new boot is starting, that was expected. It will now fetch it from TFTP, starting the kernel. And now we have starting the kernel as last message that we see. So what should we do? I mean, start, starting kernel is still from U-boot. So this means either the kernel has not loaded or something went wrong when it basically should start. Um, yeah, for that, we, could, we should consider early... Con you could also use now JTAG, but <laughs> before you do use JTAG to debug the kernel, because that is sometimes a bit hard, there is this feature early con. Feature, early con is a special serial driver, which loads much earlier in the boot process because the kernel normally does cache the print k message and then when the serial driver is ready it will print all of them so we will still see all the messages but in a later boot stage if you use early con then you can th that will even probe earlier and therefore it will also print the message much earlier so consider using that because maybe you just it just stopped working before it basically showed something. So we now use this and it looks more or less the same. It will still load and then and now we see messages. So that's, that's uh, because we are now using early con and it can print something. Um, what is failing here, so now we have to understand or we have to check the boot lock because we get it, so it's good. We have the serial console, which is something we require, as mentioned earlier. And here we can see it says um, PSCI program for conduit method from DT is the last message, so maybe we should look in the direction of P PSCI. PSCI is a feature to turn off additional um, CPU cores. Um, through a standard API from ARM. And it is often implemented in software. Um, what we would then figure out is that on this line here, you cannot see it, it would basically say, this is reserved memory for PSCI. As said, it is trusted firmware, which then implements the API. That's a bit, uh, that's why this is uh, using this, in, uh, this, this different uh, memory areas. However, if you had a closer look before, you maybe have seen that I set here the FTT address to this, this value here. And because we now set the FTT address to the area where we have the PSCI, we basically destroy the PSCI when loading the device tree. So this is easy to fix, we just remove that line. And now we are basically able to boot. 
So now it loads to RAMdisk and it will start Linux. And we could log in. So this is basically the whole bring up. So we are now done. <laughs> but normally this is not, not really true. So this just means our most important peripherals now work. But now we, we have maybe some drivers which also should work like a display or um, some sensors. So we will now try to, to get that working. So as an example, we want to have a display that works. However, it is not showing anything. So the first thing what we should do is we should check the system uh, SUSAFAS. A SUSAFAS provides us some information about the kernel subsystem, what drivers it was able to probe. You can find a ton of information from the SUSAFAS. It's, it's always a bit chaotic, but you should dig into it and uh, it gives you a lot of information. So here, for example, as said, we don't have the display, which is, is not working. Um, and we just check this path and we can see, okay, there is, there is no, easy, no display controller and no panel. This is what we would expect. So this is the display controller card zero, TSA is the panel, and, but it is not appearing. So <clears throat> what do we do next? We would have to figure out what panel do we, do we use. Oh no, first we have to figure out yeah, we have to analyze the, kernel, uh, the, the DMS clock, of course. So we have to check the whole kernel lock, not just grab for something. That's just to show you it a bit easier. But you should really take the whole lock and check what could fail, what was fa failing, what was going on. So here um, we can see that one driver, the MIPDSI driver, set deferred probe pending. So this means deferring normally means it waits on something which is not there yet. So it has some dependency issue. So we have now to figure out what exactly are our dependencies, so what kind of panel driver do we have. For that we check again the device tree of the kernel. And um, we can see we have this panel, one shalom something, and that's from a panel Illitech uh, driver file, which has the same compatibility. So we know now which driver we have to to analyze and we can now enhance it with some debug information. This is at least how I normally do it. So how does this work? You can just um, add some print f in the uh, print case, sorry, it's kernel, um, where I normally print the function name, file and line. So this gives me an indication where which parts of the code were executed and which one not and then I know where I have to dig into it. One other nice feature is Thumbstack. Thumbstack um, would not be required to debug this issue. It is the same function which is used by kernel panics and kernel warnings, but it gives you a backtrace. And I often use it if I don't understand the call graph and I have to, to search which is the, the main or where, where did my driver got called from. So to analyze the thumb stack info, this is a set, this is not to debug this issue, but um, it's anyway handy. You can just see a backtrace. Uh, this is the thumb stack. We see our probe function was called by MIPTSI driver probe. So this is the, the parent driver of, of which was calling us. And um, we can then use this string together with a script to figure out on what line our code is basically executed. So this is the the, the function name, this is the offset, and that's the function size. And with this script, we can transfer that information into a line number. That's just something, I, it's really handy, and it, it, I sometimes use it, but not to debug this issue. For that, we have added this PR info things, and we can see the last message we have on the, for, from the driver is on line 1370 here. Then we have again a look into the file or in the driver. We can see we have one um, message here. We would have another one here, but this one we never reach. So um, that means this function probably failed. And we already know it, it didn't fail hardly, it just said I defer because a dependency is not fulfilled. So most likely we have a problem with the backlight. 
So we check again the device tree, what backlight driver does our um, driver basically expect. So it's again, this is the, the uh, panel entry and then it has a dependency to this PW backlight, TPWM backlight. So now we can check, is this driver even enabled? If we grab the proc config.gc, that's something that has to be enabled, that it works, but the config you should always find somewhere or then maybe you find it through the build process. You grab for backlight and you would figure out, oh, this backlight PWM is only compiled as module. And maybe you remember I said, in your initial bring up file system, you maybe have not the modules available and that's now a problem because we don't have this module, uh, the modules in the, the, the root file system for the bring up. We will not be able to load that driver. So we can just replace this M with a J and then compile the kernel again. And then we are able to see our display. And maybe we are even lucky and it shows already something. Um, yeah, from the, the, the file system, so Linux has a lot of different file, or a lot, it has three, three interesting file systems. One is the SysFS, which I showed you earlier. The SysFS gives you information about the subsystem information. It can tell you the state of drivers. It can even give you information about the device tree, something I show here. So it, if you're not sure if the device tree you're currently working with is really the one you're expecting, then just check this one here because that's what the kernel sees. And <laughs> I lately had the problem that U-boot was basically changing the, the, the status of one node from enabled, uh, from okay to, to disabled. And this is not something that is easily to figure out if you don't check the real um, device tree because you would expect it, it was enabled. Or you can also trigger actions, I can unbind drivers and so on. Another nice file system is the debug FS. This is something which is not implemented by all drivers, but it is optional. And for example, if you want to see the clock tree, you can get the clock summary from the debug FS, um, which gives you information about the clock tree. If, you, if your serial port, for example, would uh, not achieve the right baud rate, you can figure out why maybe your clock tree is just set up wrong. Same for pin mixing. And then we have the PROCFS. The PROCFS normally provides you information about processes. However, it also provides you information about drivers, interrupts, and so on. And that's um, something which I use sometimes, for example, if I want to figure out, oh, some manufacturers, they just put the offset of registers in the reference manual, and then you can just check the, this IOMM file to figure out what is the absolute address. You would also figure it out through the reference manual, but sometimes it's a bit hard. <clears throat> ah, yeah, and then if you know the register address, you have, again, you can use utilities in Linux to do more debugging like defmem is the same as MD in U-Boot, tool, which is similar to MII, to debug Ethernet issues, FI, FI issues, ETH tool. I don't, I don't go into detail, but this one are really handy and some, something you should also um, consider is performance testing, not to, to check how fast your system is, but to find stability issues. So for, with iperf, you can figure out if your Ethernet is maybe f having failures or it shows some CRC check errors and so on. So that's just to stress the system. That's already it. Um, here a short summary. What should you consider when doing a bring up? Get, as, get involved as early as possible in the design process. The earlier you start together with the hardware team, um, the better the bring up will go. Then work as a team with the hardware. Do not see them as enemies, they are your friends, you are a team. You have to work with them. That's something some developers sometimes forget. Then be prepared when the hardware arrives. Just 
that you are up to speed as quick as possible. That helps everyone, the hardware team, that helps you. And perhaps some of the methods I showed you today um, will help you in the next bring up so that you get the hardware up much faster. Okay, that's it. I would like to give you some time for questions. I would have three more slides about kernel, so JTAG and kernel and KGDB. But yeah, unfortunately, I don't have the time to speak about it. But uh, yeah, just ask questions. Yes, here is one. Yeah. Um, basically, what so I used Open OCD to debug. Uh, so the question was um, because we have several cores on the AM62. If JTAG debugging ha or I had some issues with JTAG debugging because you have to connect to the correct core if you want to do debugging. And um, I'm, I'm, I was using Open OCD, um, and there it will spawn. Uh, or it will open a port for each core. So you have for each core a separate GDB port available and then you can connect to GDB to that port. But th this is especially, if you then do multi-core debugging, this is for example one difference between Linux debugging with JTAG or KGDB. You have to know that and you have to connect to each core or make, them, make, the, make GDB aware that you have several cores, else it will just set the breakpoint for one core and not for all of them. Are, are there other questions? Yes? Um, uh, did you have, like, when you were DFUing, was, was it the R5 firmware you were DFUing? Or um, it's the DFU. What, in, for the initial step, you said you, you DFUed. Yeah. I forgot which. Yeah, it uh, uses DF, USB DFU for um, the R5, so that's the boot ROM, which already starts DFU, then you load the, the R5 SPL through that, and that SPL will again start DFU, and then it will fetch the uh, SPL plus the uncrusted firmware for the A53 core, that will then start again DFU, and then, so you have three was, steps. Was that something you, was that something that provided binary, or was that something you had to compile from source? No, that's something that's Forcing by the BSP, so this is how TI um, does the, it's, yeah, how TI does it, and also Toradex. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, of course. Um, you said you would actually change the device tree. Like, was that on purpose or like? Um, yeah, it, it was not for that CPU, but U boot can. It, it has this fix up uh, mechanism where it can, for example, disable. CPUs that are not available on your SOC. So let's assume you have uh, SOC with up to four cores, but sometimes there are only two there. Then it can disable the additional cores. And it, this was a feature. I think it was the, the um, video processing unit on the IMX8 that was disabled by U-Boot because some, some of the same series have the video decoding unit and some not. That was the, other questions? Okay, then I think I would close. Thank you very much for the attention and um, I hope you enjoyed it.